Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good church. Morning. Lisa, Dr. David, and I are here delighted to be with you this morning, and we wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually, of course, uh, to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. David, will you pray for God's blessing on this morning's Absolutely. lesson? Absolutely. My pleasure. Our loving Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, we are delighted about the victory that was achieved on the cross. We have the privilege to learn about it today, and we have the privilege to talk about it to the world today, Lord. And that was your commandment to us. Go and let the world know about Jesus, our Savior, our brother, our Redeemer on the cross. So as we study the lesson today, Lord, be with each one of us, not just here, but people that will be watching or hearing this. Lord, it should not be our word at any time because that would be foolishness. Amen. Therefore, I ask that you direct everyone's attention, their heart, their minds, their mouth towards our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross today. As we study, Lord, I ask that you give special blessing to Miss Alicia, um, our respected Victor, and myself, so that we can all provide the words from the Spirit that you have given us, our Holy Spirit. Again, Lord, please forgive our sins and be with us, be with everyone that will be coming, be with all of them on this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Really, this is an incredible team. I'm, I'm just delighted to be with Elisa and, uh, and with Dr. David today. The week's Sabbath, this week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, He Died for Us. Now, He Died for Us means that Christ died for us. So we really are going to talk about Christ's death. The key text, the memory text, is found in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And uh, it's an incredible text. It actually says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so much must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, in the wilderness, Israel knew that the serpent was a symbol of the coming Savior. And it was permanent because it was raised up. They could see it. And so they also knew that it was necessary to look at the serpent with genuine faith to be healed from any bite that they received, from any, any hurt that they got. Likewise, faith in the infinite sacrifice at Calvary, of Calvary, brings healing from the ravages of sin. On his last day of teaching in the temple, Jesus declared in John chapter 12, verses 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. In the Gospel of John, the expression lifted up always refers to the crucifixion of Jesus. You can, you can also see that in John chapter 8, verses 28, and John 12, 34. All right, let's, um, as a brief overview, as an introduction to this week's Sabbath School lesson, I want to make the, 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 the following uh, statements and presentation. Christ's substitutionary death is the central truth of cosmic dimension. And I want you to remember that. His substitutionary death is the central truth of cosmic dimensions. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice, for he died for your sins and for my sins. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, Therefore, in all things Christ had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. 
The Apostle John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the, the righteous. Verse 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Incredible promise. The greatest sacrifice ever made was offered when the king of the whole universe came to our sinful world, lived sinless as a human person, and died for us in our place. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, makes it very clear that true Christianity is cross-centered, has to be cross-centered. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 tells us, and this is Paul speaking, and I, brethren, he's talking to his brethren in the church of Corinth, and I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of Christ. Verses 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's a challenge for you, and that's a challenge for me. Paul is stating here, that the cross of Jesus is the central message that he is embraced. And he is the message that he brings to the Corinth. That's the message that he brings to the, to the church of Corinth and to Christian believers everywhere. Ellen G. White, writing in Gospel Workers, page 315, tells us, the sacrifice of Christ is an atonement for sin, uh, as an atonement for sin, is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. She goes on to say, I present before you the great grand momentum of mercy and regeneration, monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption. The Son of God uplifted on a cross. Grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. And then, writing again in Gospel Workers, page 156, Ellen White says, of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost an uplifting Christ before the world. See, the death of Jesus on the cross is the foundational stone on which all biblical teachings is, um, is anchored. Jesus Christ came to this earth for manifold reasons. As an introduction to this week's Sabbath School lesson, I would like to highlight the following reasons. Christ came to redeem humanity. Christ came to this world to reveal to us the true loving character of God. Christ came to this world to defeat Satan and refute his false claim. And Christ also came to this world to prove that the first Adam could have obeyed God as Christ in his humanity fulfilled perfectly all the law and lived a sinless, a sinless holy life. Christ's resurrection is central to our faith. He came to this world to die for you and for me so that we could have an opportunity to live eternally. This week, our Sabbath school lesson focused on Christ's death and what it means for the promise of eternal life. Elisa, Scripture tells us that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. Please review and summarize Sunday's lesson for us. Thank you, Victor. Sunday's lesson explores what the Bible says about when the plan of salvation was formed. Did God quickly devise and implement a plan to save the human family after Adam and Eve took the fruit from the forbidden tree? Or was there such a plan much earlier than that, even before the earth was created? 
Revelation 13.8 tells us that the Lamb, Jesus, was slain from the foundation of the world. So how is it possible that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world? That implicates from before the world was created. When the Messiah didn't come until 4,000 years approximately after the earth was created. Well, before we jump into this topic, I'd like to discuss a business analogy that we may be familiar with, business continuity planning. Although the analogy may be imperfect, I think we can gain some insights from this. So many businesses have a business continuity plan, and that defines how grit critical business operations will continue in the event of a crisis or a disaster of some nature. Such a plan is intended to minimize a financial loss and enable the business to continue to serve customers during such an event. Various disaster scenarios are typically part of such a plan. We can think of physical disasters like a fire or earthquake, cyber attacks, economic disasters, health, like you know, the recent COVID um, experience we've had, other potential risks as well. Such plans are typically inclusive of processes, procedures, and what roles various people will play and what decisions they will make and, and who will make those decisions. Other such details that should be quickly enacted should such a, a disaster occur. So although humans cannot, cannot predict the future, giving prudent forethought and planning to such unforeseen events can certainly help mitigate the negative impact of the event on the business. So if man in his imperfect wisdom and inability to predict the future gives enough forethought to preserve their business, would God, who is all-knowing and, and sovereign and full of wisdom, not give some forethought to his own creation and the sustainment of it? So God, in his great wisdom and love, also devised a plan to save and reconcile his creation should they choose to transgress his perfect law. Ellen White, in The Great Controversy, writes, the law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all created beings depended upon their perfect accord with the service of love. He takes no pleasure in a forced allegiance, and to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. With this freedom of will, there is also risk. Risk that the created being, whether it's an angel or man, would voluntarily choose to not serve him, thus transgressing his law and break the perfect relationship and harmony with heaven. Let's read more about what the Bible says about the plan of salvation from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13:8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Revelation tells us that at the end of time, when Christ returns, even the unrighteous will worship him. And this verse identifies Christ as a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, there was a plan for man's salvation in place before the earth was created. And central to that plan was the death of Jesus, the perfect lamb of God on the cross. Acts 2, to 24 tells us, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So Acts tells us that Jesus was delivered to be crucified by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. In other words, Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and the timing of its occurrence was all part of God's plan. Amen. In 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, Peter writes, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Peter is also telling us that the Godhead knew before the earth was created that Jesus would be the antitypical sacrificial lamb and that he was predestined for this. John 1.29 says, and this is when John the Baptist was referring to Jesus as baptism, said that Jesus is the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. In other worlds, words, there was already a plan. In Titus 1, 2, we read, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In this text, Paul proclaims his faith and hope in eternal life is based on Jesus Christ, who was promised before time began, or before the earth was created. Ellen White in Desire of Ages states, the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. That plan was revealed to Adam and Eve just after their fall in Eden. We read about that in Genesis 3.15. And was typified by every blood sacrifice throughout the Old Testament sacrificial service. That plan is now ratified by the blood of Christ, and that promise of eternal life with God remains for us. So we go on to Tuesday. Yep. yep. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay. And of course, Tuesday, Monday. Has a, uh, I mean, Monday, Monday. <laughs> has a very interesting uh, title, a preface to the cross. Yes. So, Doc, yeah. just explain and summarize what, what that was. Yeah, be. you know, this is a um, Alicia said it so nicely, you know, that the cross is at the beginning of everything, beginning of universe, actually, mm -hmm. because God created the universe and he said, I'm God. But then, you know, why would we follow God? God's character has to be established. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why we have the cross. And just, it's such a beautiful topic because we know that cross is at the foundation of every creation. And then we see the cross, Alicia, you mentioned it, in Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, 15, the Satan, the serpent, is on the tree. And what does the serpent do? Take away the character of God, questions it, and allows Adam and Eve to question God's character and accuse one another. That's the other cross. That's the cross on this earth, the first cross, right? That's the cross before the actual cross of Jesus Christ. And then we see what happens. Israelites are coming out of Egypt. And here we see that Jesus tells Moses, speak to the rock. So the water comes out. Here Moses loses patience or maybe feels a little prideful. He hits the rock and water gushes out, symbolizing how Jesus was on the cross. And when people hit him, water came out mm -hmm. from the side of his body. Again, after that, let me set the stage. This is in Numbers 20, um, verse, uh, ver 21, uh, verses 4 and 5. Here, this is very important because when Satan taught Adam and Eve to accuse God and not believe him, God, God told Adam and Eve, because you did not obey my commandment and heeded to the voice of the serpent, then I'm going to you know, then you will surely die, right? But there is always that solution from the beginning of the creation. So here, Numbers 21, 4, 5, what happens is um, Israelites are supposed to want to go through Edom. Edom is Esau, their brother, but Edomites do not let them. So their heart sinks. And so what they do is they started blaming God. God's character again is in question. In fact, they were so upset they, this is what they, the verse 5, Numbers 21, verse 5, it says, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Think about it. God produces manna from the, you know, from the heavens, and they hate it. They hate it. I mean, what, what kind of, you know, what 
type, I mean, that is like the ultimate, you know, question against God, right? And so God, again, sends the serpent to symbolize what happened in Garden of Eden. And again, they repent. And again, God said, whenever you ask for forgiveness, I will forgive. That's my nature. And so Moses lifts up the serpent and they look and by faith, Victor mentioned it, by faith with the grace of God, they are saved. So this is the Old Testament. Now, you know what's interesting? I always thought, how did Israelites misinterpret Jesus' coming on this planet? I go to Samuel, 1 Samuel verse uh, chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. Uh, actually, verse um, 7. Here, Israelites says, you know what? I, we don't want Jesus anymore as our king. We want an actual king yep. and an actual kingdom right there, right there. So here, here, uh, verse 7 says, And the Lord told him, Listen to all that people are saying to you. It is not uh, you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Right there, rejection of Jesus Christ the misinterpretation of prophecy because the Jesus came for the another world. He said, my kingdom is not here. And they missed that. And we know that in Old Testament, in Isaiah 24, God predicts that the earth is going to be destroyed, everything. In Daniel, we know, but they did not realize it because they are focused on their earth. And then God told the Israelites that they will be the light of this world. But instead, they do not share God with anyone just like a country club situation right now here comes jesus finally on this earth exactly. right and so jesus like you said john the baptist says here i declare the lamb of god how much clear can you be right they don't understand it because they're all focused on oh we're under roman empire you know we need to be a supreme we're power ready. yes we're going to destroy them we're going to be the superpower who cares about other races? They're not God's children. We are the only one. Country club attitude, right? But Jesus comes for everyone. So Jesus then starts telling them, Matthew 16, 22, 23, and then tells Peter. And guess what? Peter says, oh, no, Lord. I, you know, Peter must have been a little bit older than Jesus, I assume. I don't know that. But Jesus then says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block, right? We do that to people when they want to do good, right? We sometimes become stumbling block. Mark 9, 31, they were afraid when Jesus told them. Matthew 17, uh, 23, they were sad. So look at all these negative emotions. Here, these emotions are a stumbling block to Jesus when they could have been more, you know, tell him that, you know what, Lord, we're here to support you, right? So this is what's going on. In fact, Jesus even tells Nicodemus, Right, John three fourteen, that the Son of Man must be lifted up, and 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 be you know and um, and he will bring uh, the you know the end to all this suffering. But yet through all this, they're always thinking about the earthly kingdom because they have rejected in First Samuel, God Jesus Christ as their king. So uh, what is the learning point? Well, the learning point is that as Adventists or Christians we might be thinking that, hey, we got this, okay? It's a country club attitude. We got this, right? But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, even the very elect can be deceived. Remember this. This is the, you know, the, the issue is, you got to remember this world that we live, this life, it's the wilderness. Wilderness. We are in the wilderness, and this is where we're building the character of loyalty, the faith. So Jesus says what? Um, uh, in everything, be anxious for in nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let all your requests be made known. See, we got to have that attitude of gratitude. And we need to be happy because the cross is not just at the beginning of the earth, you know, of, of the universe. It's throughout the whole Old Testament. It's in when it actually happened. And Jesus said, told us to carry our cross and follow him. Now we are the cross bearer. And ultimately, he is the cross himself. Jesus on the cross is going to come and take us to heaven. In fact, Victor, I suspect that our crown will have the cross in there with Jesus on it. That's my suspicion, you know, because what would be in that case, I will never, ever forget that the cross is what it's all about, not just one time throughout history. So we got to remember this and share it. Read the Bible daily because in Psalms 4, 5, it says, Psalms chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. And that is the cross. Cross is there for us. Why? 
so we can learn to put our trust in the Lord and not complain like the Israelites did. Always stop that so that we can be there with God. Thanks, David. And, and that's so true. You, you know, you brought Nicodemus into being in Desire of Ages. I think it's pages yeah. 775, 776. Uh, L. G. White addresses that very issue. Yeah. Here's Nicodemus, and he's looking at Christ at the cross. Yeah. And the discussion that Christ has with him yeah. comes all to the fore, and he begins to realize, mm. my Savior on the cross for me. It's just, just amazing. And, and Victor, because of that, Daniel chapter 9 right. says that our goal in this wilderness is nothing right. but to point everybody to, to, the, to, cross. to the cross. Because then we become stars That's it. That's in, it. Heaven. in heaven. Oh, it's, what a blessing. All right. So far, so good. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed our discussion, our explanation of the lesson to date. I'm going to... Um, uh, explain a little bit of, of Tuesday, and I'm going to provide quite a lot of information. I'm hoping that you've studied the lesson because I'm not going to make any reference to what's in the lesson. So um, I, I hope that you, uh, you will enjoy that explanation. So um, Tuesday is entitled, It is Finished. And it is Finished is a declaration, one of the seven statements that God makes on the cross as he, as he is dying for you and for me. And um, so, you know, the question is, what is the crucial message to us in the Jesus statement, it is finished? And um, here's how the, apostle, the apostles, John and Luke, describe Christ's last set of words or sentences while dying on the cross. I want to begin with that so that we can really uh, do our due diligence. So John, writing uh, in his epistles, uh, chapter 19, verses 28 to 30, says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now, I thirst is really the sixth, the fifth, the fifth statement that he made. I thirst. Verse 29. Now, a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. I like what Luke writes in chapter 23, verses 46, because he really explains better the last statement that Jesus made. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, it is written, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. The statement, it is finished, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is a loud shout of victory. There is nothing but victory in the statement. It is a cry of jubilation. jubilation. Joy. Joy. It is finished. Tells us that Christ has accomplished what he came into the world to do. So for, for us th th this morning, I have prepared, um, I have dissected the statement, it is finished, into seven declarations that God makes. And I'm going to go through those very briefly. So first, we see the accomplished fulfillment of all the prophecies which had been written of Christ and his death. Centuries before end, the prophets of God had described step by step the humiliation and suffering which the coming Savior would undergo. And one by one, and by the way, there are a significant number of prophecies. And one by one, these were fulfilled to the very letter. Number one, the second declaration in this statement, it is written. By the way, in the old Hebrew, Hebrew, word, Hebrew uh, language, it was only a word. It is finished. The second is that, uh, that we see here the completion of his suffering. Christ endured physical mental and spiritual anguish. Appropriately, he was 
de designated the man of sorrows in Scripture. The physical sufferings were excruciating, but even this was nothing compared with his anguish of the soul for your salvation and for my salvation. The third declaration that is made in that statement it is written is that the goal of incarnation is accomplished. You see, before the Lord Jesus came to this earth, a definite work was committed to him. He came to fulfill God's will. The mission upon which God had sent his son into the world was now fulfilled, accomplished. Nothing remained to be added. The fourth declara declaration that we can get, get out of this particular statement is that we see the accomplishment of the atonement fulfilled. You see, Luke chapter 19, verses 10, tells us that the Son of Man came to our world to seek and to save that which was lost. All this involved the cross. So let me explain. You see, the lost which Christ came to seek could only be found there at the cross in the place of death and under the condemnation of God. Sinners could be saved only by Christ, the one who took their place and bore their iniquities. They who were under the law could be redeemed only by Jesus Christ who fulfilled its requirements and suffered the curse of the cross and its death. Our sins could be taken away only by their being blotted out by the precious blood of Jesus Christ at the cross. You see, the fifth declaration that is made with that, st that particular statement says that the, sin the, the cleansing of the sins was totally fulfilled. The sins of the believer, all of them were transferred to the Savior. Scripture tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of, of us all. If God laid my iniquities in Christ, they are no longer in me. When the sinner believes in the Lord Jesus and receives him by faith as his Lord and Master, he is no longer under condemnation. Sin is no longer on him. The guilt, the condemnation, the penalty of sin is no longer on you and on me when you know that your sins have been, have been forgiven. The sixth declaration with that statement is that the fulfillment of the law's requirement is complete. Not only did the Savior keep the precepts of the law, but he also suffered its penalty and endured its curse. We have broken the law and taking our place Jesus Christ received, uh, received its just sentence, death, on your behalf and my behalf. And then finally, we see in this statement, it is finished, the destruction of Satan's power. The cross sounded the death knelt of the devil's power. To human appearances, it looked like the moment of his greatest triumph, and I'm talking about Satan's, yet in reality, it was the hour of Satan's ultimate defeat. And what a joy. In the context of the cross, the Savior declared in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of the world, now is the ruler of this world, uh, uh, of this world will be cast out. So it is finished. This was not a cry of despair from a helpless martyr. It was not a last grasp of a worn-out life of Jesus. No, this was a declaration on the part of the divine Redeemer that all for which He came from heaven to earth to do was now done. That all that was needed to reveal the full character of God had now been accomplished. That all that was required by the law before sinners could be saved had now been performed. And that the full price of our redemption was now paid for. On that cross, as our Savior breathed his last, the curtain of the temple, which for centuries had symbolized the alienation of sinners from God, was torn in two from top to bottom, 
in order to demonstrate that the sin barrier had been removed by God so that the way into his presence was now open. 36 hours later, God raised Jesus from the dead. He was he who had been condemned for us in his death was publicly vindicated in his resurrection. It was God's decisive demonstration that God had not died in vain. It is finished. In this statement, in this word, is contained the ground, the foundation of the believer's assurance. It is, his, is discovered the sum of all joy and the and the, and the very spirit of all divine consolation. At the cross, we see God's grace. At the cross, the Son is magnified. At the cross, the foundation was laid to make this possible, to make it happen. Elisa, what has Christ's death accomplished for us? Thank you, Victor. That was a, a really great segue to the topic we're going to explore here. A couple key questions we'll talk about is, why did Christ have to die for us? And what did his death accomplish? And then finally, what hope does that ha his death have for us today? So in John 3, 14 through 18, I know uh, probably all of us are, are familiar with at least part of this, but it's, it's definitely worth reviewing again here. It says, And as Moses was lifted up by the serpent in the desert, excuse me, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, it, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. So according to this text, it was necessary for God himself, in the person of his Son, to die for sin, the sin of the whole world. Only the blood of Christ the death of the lawgiver and creator of the world could satisfy the penalty of sin and cover iniquity of fallen humanity in his own righteousness. The text tells us that God so loved us that he willingly paid this high price, that if we believe in his son, we will not perish, but will have eternal life in God. If we accept Christ as our savior, his Blood is applied to us as a substitution for our guilt and transgression. God is unwilling that any should be condemned, but that we all may be saved through his Son. Ellen, White's, Ellen White writes in Letter 43, 1895, The scheme of redemption far exceeds the comprehension of the human mind. The great condensation on the part of God is a mystery, that is beyond our fathoming. The greatness of the plan cannot be fully comprehended, nor could infinite wisdom devise a plan that would surpass it. It could only be successful by the clothing of divinity with humanity, by Christ becoming man and suffering the wrath which sin has made because of transgression of God's law. Through this plan, the great the dreadful God can be just and yet be the justifier of all who believe in Jesus and who receive him as their personal savior. This is the heavenly sacrifice, or excuse me, the heavenly science of redemption, of saving men from eternal ruin and can be carried out only through the incarnation of the Son of God in humanity through his triumph over sin and death, and in seeking to fathom this plan, all finite intelligences are baffled. Truly, in our limited understanding, we can, completely un can we completely understand the mysteries of God? We are called to believe because he said it, and the Bible tells us God cannot lie. In Romans 6.23, we, we read, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Here Paul is emphasizing that we have earned death. In other words, our works, our actions, our thoughts, our words, they are sinful and we are deserving of death. However, he goes on to say that God has given us the gift of eternal life through his son. It was the perfect life and shed blood of Christ as our substitute that makes us worthy of that gift. When we accept Christ as our savior, God accepts Christ's works and his righteousness in our place. Although we deserve to be condemned, God has made it possible for us to have redemption. The Bible tells us that Christ, who is the one who created all things, voluntarily offered himself as our substitute. In Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, we read, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Furthermore, Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for all and never loses its power. In Hebrews 10, 9 to 12, comparing Christ's sacrifice to the Old Testament sacrificial system, Paul writes, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. In other words, Jesus is the antitype of the Old Testament sacrificial service. And then he goes on to say, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Exactly. How personal is Christ's sacrifice to you? Do you wonder whether your sins can truly be covered by Christ's blood and that God cares whether or not you're saved? Ellen White in Ministry of Healing writes, If but one soul would have accepted the gospel of his grace, Christ would, to save that one, have chosen his life of toil and humiliation and his death of shame. And furthermore, in Desire of Ages, she writes, By his life and his death, Christ has achieved more, even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we became more closely united to God that if we had never, as if we had never fallen. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. So we are not forgiven just because God loves us. Rather, God sent his son to die in our place because he loves us. So God can forgive sin only because of the death of Christ Amen. that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Elisa. What a, and I hope, I hope that we can see that. David, yes. Thursday's uh, lesson is, is incredible. It, it is. I feel, like, I feel like you should be the one doing Thursday's no, 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 lesson. No, 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 no. Because you I always think. talk about the cross. But, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to really try to explain this because the more I understand it, my eyes tear up. Absolutely. Elisha said something that yep. because God, you know, Satan yep. wanted to separate us from God, mm -hmm. right? But I will tell you this. Um, let's go, and I want to I read... Um, Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse 28. Mm -hmm. Jesus is talking about defining sin in a different way. He's saying, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already, commi already committed adultery with her in his heart. Thinking about sin is already a sin, which is an interesting concept because here we see the character of Satan is what? Accusation and self-exaltation. And God's character is forgiveness and self-sacrifice. No human being can ever understand that. Now, when Jesus, I always thought, okay, how is it that Jesus, what does the cross really mean to me? Am I really appreciating the cross? Do we really appreciate the cross? And if we do, 
then would we not have peace? I, I, this is what my understanding is, that Jesus died the second death on the cross. Exactly. How did that happen? Well, let's look at it this way. Jesus came to forgive us. Satan is always accusing us. Now, every interaction, Victor, Jesus had, whether it could be good or bad, in his mind, he could get upset. Absolutely. In his situation, he's hungry. Absolutely. He doesn't have a place to live. Absolutely. He could mm -hmm. curse something about you know the whole situation that he's here. Guess what? The moment that happens, God knows his heart. Jesus is gone forever. Correct. Jesus would have been gone forever, and we would be lost forever. If we do not understand this, okay, then we're not understanding cross at all. Right. Because I know that if Jesus died the second death for us, and any thought about how he lived his life with any bitterness, there would be no quality of blemish-less lamb that he was. No human being can do that. To me, that is the meaning of cross as a Christian. Now, if anybody else, the worldly people, to them, the Sabbath school lesson says, Greek's word is, it's moronic. It's moronic because how would this happen? You know, I always go back to the first blessing that God uttered on the humanity. He said, let us make man and woman in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over all things and let them be fruitful and they multiply. You see, in our crown, that is the first blessing. And you know what? Anything first always goes, always goes. So we are God's children from the beginning of creation. Therefore, Jesus, because God loves us so much, he created that way that he would take that risk with Jesus. And Jesus would voluntarily take the risk of being lost forever. That is Satan wanted to do. That is God and Jesus did to us. That is the character of God on the cross. Now, the Sabbath school lesson mentions five things that the cross you know, that tells us, okay, to meaning. Cross is God's justice against sin. You know, we take sin kind of willy-nilly because we say, okay, God is going to forgive this and that, right? But sin to God, the rebellion, the accusation quality. You know, Adam and Eve, right away they started to accuse each other because Satan accused God and they learned from him, right? Right away they condemned each other. So sin is a bad deal. It's so bad that Jesus had to take the risk of losing his life forever to save us. Also, cross is where the love of God came because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who could have been lost forever for our sake, but he lived a perfect life for our sake so we can be. So the love of God is also on the cross. Victor mentioned that the power of Satan finished on the cross. It is finished, okay? The power, Satan's nature was revealed on the cross. Satan led Jesus to be on the cross. So then we see that God says, you know, listen to me. I created you, okay? And Satan says, don't listen to God because he's hiding things. But guess what? At the cross, Victor, it's crystal clear. God's character, Satan character. And Satan is finished, right? And then you have the fourth one is that Alicia mentioned, the hope of eternal life. It's the hope. that Why? Because Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. So what did he do? First blessing, create man and woman in our image and likeness and have dominion. So that's the word that Jesus spoke. So why that was never going to pass away, no matter what the cost is, because God's word is trustworthy. And that is our hope. And number five is there is not going to be any more rebellion because we saw the nature of Satan and God. There is never going to be a question whether God is forgiving, self-sacrificing God. What does Jesus say in John 15? He says, there is no greater love than laying down your life for your fellow brethren. Jesus called us friends. Amen. You know that. Jesus, just like he called Abraham. He says, you're not servants anymore. You are my friends. My that is, sisters, sisters. Exactly. that is the cross. Friends, we're all friends with God like Abraham. Doesn't matter what, where you come from. Just remember 
what God is about. See, Jesus, Jesus came down from heaven, down here, okay? And what, what did Jesus say? You cannot put both of your feet, one on this kingdom right. and one in God's kingdom. Exactly right. Jesus was in the world, but he's not of the world. All of us are in the world and of the world. Exactly right. All of us are Jesus' enemy. Jesus says, what good is it if you love your friend? Love your enemy. Guess who loved his enemy the most? Jesus Christ. Guess who was the worst? I mean, the, the lowest of the low in the society? Jesus Christ. That's why he's the greatest of the great in heaven. And that, that, so God said, it, yet it pleased him to bruise Jesus. He, the, the sin, the penalty was on Jesus. And everything that he did in this earth did it with gratitude that he loves us so much. That is in his mind all the time. Can you and I ever do that? I mean, in any little interaction, we might get upset, curse somebody, or, you know, complain about it. That is impossible. You see, that's the worldly foolishness. They will never understand it. Because in the world, if we forgive, or we show, say, you know, we love one and our enemies, people would consider a character of weakness. But here, we see that that is the greatest character of strength. And that is what we must take to the world as Christians. Because with that message... With that message, we can see that the peace will come. And because Jesus said so, and he did it on the cross, and his first blessing is, we are his brother, sister. We are God's children. We are going to be that. There is no question about it. And I really appreciate getting this, this, this cross, the meaning of cross to us, because the moment I think that Jesus could have been gone forever, he could have been gone forever, I cannot imagine what has happened and now i have a different perspective friends i want you to t remember that then you and i will talk to each other with love and we will always point everybody to jesus no matter what because at the moment i feel like i'm i'm, I'm saying something really nice is the moment i risk losing salvation because there's nothing i can say nice or great other than jesus christ then that is the worldly foolishness that we have. We think that our wisdom can supersede the cross. It cannot. It will never. And that's going to be there in heaven too. And that is the message. Thank you. Thanks so much, Doc. Thank you. Yeah, the oh, meaning of the cross. I, I wanted I'll to show you, yes. guys, um, this is uh, something we, well, you know, we were thinking. You can see this is the cross at the bottom. It's the foundation of everything. And then this is, you see that serpent and at the core of it is John 3.16, the serpent on the cross. And then you have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's all around the earth. And then you can see everything yeah. else. So this is where all everything was built upon. Right. This is the cross. This is Jesus Christ. This is who we are Amen. in the future. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much, David. Um, thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Alisa. Final thoughts. Final, yeah, final. I, I love on your diagram how there's a heart in the middle of that cross. Yeah. You know, as Adventists and as Christians, we, 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 we talk a lot about God's love, yeah. and right, rightly so, because the Bible says, you know, we love him because he first loved us. Yeah. And it is his love poured out in us that allows us to, to love him. We also, in, in Christianity, at least, in mainstream Christianity, talk a lot about his resurrection because it's a very ce celebratory event, mm -hmm. right? We don't focus enough on the cross. We don't, we Absolutely don't. Absolutely correct. You know, and, and the work that was done on the cross mm -hmm. right. is the only path to where we have salvation. Amen. Um, correct. We, we, we know from our own judicial system, if somebody does somebody a wrong and they go before a judge, Sometimes the penalty gets reduced. Sometimes, you know, there is very rarely there may be a situation where a judge will look at the record and disregard. Generally, there is a consequence. And, and certainly there's always a consequence whether the degree of how big that consequence is. Yeah. And why is that so? It is because there's a victim on the other side. Someone who's been wronged Correct. because a law was broken. Correct. Well, in this sense, it is God's law that was broken. So who was wrong? It was God's character that was wrong. Abs right. That's a good question. The only one that could make it right was Christ, Christ himself, exactly. the Son of God. Mm. 
And in order for us to be saved, and for, we had to have the, the, the cross. And so I'll leave you with this um, quote from Oswald Ch- Chambers. He writes, God could forgive people in no other way than by the death of his son, and Jesus is exalted as Savior because of his death. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to um, really summarize um, the lesson today by uh, making a couple of statements and uh, bringing in a little bit of the spirit of prophecy into this. As you see, as we saw this lesson, Christ's redemptive mission called him from the throne of God to the mystery of the altar of the cross of Calvary. The altar of the cross of Calvary. His all earthly ministry was pointing to and leading toward his atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Ellen G. White, in Desire of Ages, pages 25, and you know this by heart almost. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you do and know it by heart. She makes the following statement. So, Desire of Ages, pages 25. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered a death which was ours that we might receive the life which was his. Thus, with his stripes, we are healed. Ellen White goes on to say, by his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. Mm -hmm. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man, but in Christ we became more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. And pay attention to this statement. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No wonder that the Apostle Paul could say boldly, as we read in Galatians chapter 6, verses 14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. At the cross, you and I were crucified with Christ. Thus we have rejected the world as unworthy. And yes, just as we have been rejected or been rejected unworthy by the world. Likewise, As we read in Revelation chapter 5, verses 12, the heavenly hosts said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Mm -hmm. This is our this is our God. And of course, I'm looking forward to be part of the multitude. The multitude of the redeemed will also cry out with a loud voice as we read in Revelation, 7, 20, uh, Revelation chapter 7, verses 10. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. My brother and my sister and my friend, by virtue of Christ's substitutionary death, you and I have the opportunity to live eternally. What an incredible love! God's grace, what an incredible gift. My prayer is that by God's grace, you and I may be part of that great multitude that will be called faithful, God's children, and will be invited to live with God and our Savior for an eternity. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your incredible gift. Lord, it is difficult to understand. To understand how you came from heaven. How you left the throne. You came to earth. To con our... our, That which we are. Born of a woman. And lived on earth. First, to demonstrate that we could be faithful to you 
And secondly, Lord, to redeem us, to die our eternal death, and to give us an opportunity to be saved. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace. Lord, I pray that you prepare us every day to die for self, because on that cross, I died with you, Lord, and so did we. And that your resurrection, Lord, you lived to die in each one of us. Father, help us every day to give you our will so that you can mold it into yours to help us die for self. So that, Lord, as we live the rest of our lives on this earth before you come, you may be glorified in thought, in word, and in deed. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys.